down. It's great to be here. It's great to be here with everyone back in my home church. It's great to see my parents, mom, dad, and all of you, uh, the church family. I do apologize. Usually I'd like to have a PowerPoint on with my main points, but uh, I was out at a cabin with very limited technology. I was on vacation with my family, uh, so I used what resources I had available to me. The text I have chosen for today's sermon is Psalm 73. I'll be reading the full psalm. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold, for I envied the arrogant. When I saw the prosperity of the wicked, they have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from the burdens common to man. They are not plagued by human ills. Their pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves in violence. From their callous hearts comes iniquity. The evil conceits of their minds know no limits. They scoff and speak with malice. In their arrogance they threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven, and their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore, their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They say, how can God know? Does the Most High have knowledge? This is what the wicked are like. Always carefree, they increase their wealth. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure. In vain have I washed my hands in innocence. All day long I have been plagued. I have been punished every morning. If I had said, I will speak thus, I would have betrayed your children. When I tried to understand all this, it was oppressive to me. Till I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. Surely you place them on slippery places. You cast them down to ruin. <laughs> How suddenly they are destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. As a dream when one awakes, so when you arise, O Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you, yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish. You will destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me... It is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. The title I've chosen for today's sermon is God of Fortress Against Temptation. We see here the psalmist is undergoing a battle with the temptation to be drawn into the world and all of what it has to offer. He's undergoing the pressures of temptation. And that pressure, as you can see, as you go through the first half of the psalm, it keeps building and building until he's about to break. He says his foot is about to slip. In my profession, I work in the utility sector. We uh, deal with a lot of uh, gas utilities, installing gas mains, and gas pipelines. And all of these... Uh, pipes that go underground, they have a lot of information that is recorded about them because in order to operate them safely, the utility needs to know the ultimate tensile strength of that pipe. 
They need to know how much it can carry safely because if they don't know that and they operate it too high, an explosion can happen and people uh, can be killed. So one of the things I mentioned is the ultimate tensile strength of pipe. It's that point at which the pressure, as it builds and builds and builds within that steel pipe, there's a point at which that pipe can no longer hold its integrity and it is burst and it's deformed and is forever useless. That's the kind of pressures that we see here in looking at the sin and temptation that this psalmist is going to. He was getting to that point. He was getting to that bursting point. His foot had almost slipped. And then as we go through, we see that this man, uh, my central theme here is that when man is tempted by the ruler of this world, that is the devil, he cannot withstand it alone. We see, and we'll get to it, he's tried to figure it out on his own. What did that bring to him? It brought him more oppression. He could not withstand that temptation by his own, through his own devices. It is only with God as our fortress that we can prevail against the temptations of the evil one. So we'll, we'll look back at verse 1. We see the psalmist, he starts out by stating a truth. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. That is a truth. He knows that. But then we see he goes and discusses and, and opens his heart in this psalm about how he had almost slipped. He envied the prosperity of the wicked, their seemingly charmed existence. And we can see that today in, in spades. Uh, in, uh, as they used to say back when uh, color TV was something new and fangled, they could see it in technicolor. But you can see it today. We have many people on uh, various forms of social media, from YouTube to uh, the sports we see. You can see various successful people across the uh, across the spectrum from some for people like Elon Musk, uh, Jeff Bezos, the lead, uh, CEO of Amazon, and all the accolades that people hurl on them. You look at various performing artists and all the success that they garner for time. It's always fleeting. But we see the wicked, not saying that, I'm not describing certain uh, spiritual qualities of these people I mentioned, but they seem to prosper. And that's nothing new because that's what that psalmist was, dis was struggling with. He sees this and sees how they're prospering, and he is struggling with it. He's trying to, he's grappling with it. He begins to become jealous. He begins to become envious of the perceived wealth and prosperity that he sees in these wicked people around him. And we can suffer that too looking around at those in our, in our, in our circles, that are, or maybe at work, the person that just got, you know, is, is meeting with all sorts of success, or maybe they're getting a promotion, maybe they're getting uh, whatever, uh, maybe they win, win uh, some raffle or something like that, and we're like, why are all the good things happening to them? And meanwhile, I, or my family, or this other per Christian that I know is struggling. Sometimes it is challenging to, de to grapple with this, and that's why it is so important that we are reading the words because we are not the only ones that have undergone such temptations and such trials. We see here this psalmist is going through a lot of those same struggles that we deal with in, in his walk. He's, we don't know exactly what uh, was going on in his life. We know that he... Maybe he'd had some physical ailment, and maybe and that's why he's looking at why are these wicked so healthy and hale. So he saw their wealth and prosperity, and for a moment he despaired. And again, like I mentioned, it's not just us. You know, this psalmist dealt with it, but guess who else dealt with the same type of despair, the same type of temptation? We see this in Job. Job said in, ver in chapter 21, verse 7, why do the wicked live, reach old age, and grow mighty in power? There were others, uh, I won't bother go to, to go in and dis discuss those, but there are plenty of other Christians that, uh, and, that have, and incidents that have been recorded in God's word of people struggling with this temptation and this draw to go the way of the world. 
So the psalmist's conclusion is here in his as he's grappling with this temptation is the wicked are always carefree, they increase in wealth. And that really sounds great, you know, being carefree, not having cares, not having stress or anxiety, and always then increasing in wealth. You know, with that's an economic law. I am a student of economics. Uh, and one of the economic laws is more is always better. It's just the way it is. More is always better. More cars is better than, no, than, than one car. Or, so it sounds good. And then he says, looking at interest, he starts looking at himself. He says, surely I have in vain, I have kept my heart pure. In vain have I washed my hands in innocence. He's been working very hard at, at making sure that he is not uh, defiling the law of God, that he is not uh, breaking those Ten Commandments. So what is the point of righteous living if we only reap pain and suffering? This is where this man is going through his, in this temptation. And he says that all day long he is plagued with these thoughts. All day long. He's struggling, and as I mentioned, that pressure is building and building and building. It's getting hot, hotter and hotter and hotter. And every waking hour, he says, every waking hour, he is punished anew. This is, I mean, he, I don't know, I'm not a psychiatrist, but this man could be in what you consider clinical depression. Despite, however, despite all of this, going on, the inner turmoil that he is suffering, he still remains faithful. He still remains faithful to God and his people. And he does that by suppressing these thoughts and not giving voice. He doesn't give up. In verse 15, he says, if I had said, I will speak thus, I would have betrayed your people. If he started speaking and giving voice to the people that were in his circle of friends or in his uh, sphere of influence, then he could cause other people to stumble. And then as it's written in Matthew 18, verse 6, it would have been better for, mills, for him to have a large millstone hung about his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea rather than to cause another to stumble. So the psalmist remains faithful to God. He's dealing with this temptation in his heart. But he does not give voice to it to those around him. So in the 16th verse of this psalm, we see after being so punished in his spirit, he tries to reason it out. He tries to figure out why this is occurring. But where does that lead him? It only leads to more oppression. He's trying to figure it out in his mental calculus through reason through logic, why are the wicked uh, prospering? Why are the wicked always seem to be carefree and increasing in wealth? And he can't figure it out. And it begin is even more oppression for him. So this pressure is, continues to build. This temptation continues to build. He's at the end of his rope. Looking at the charts of these pipes that you know, you'll see with the ultimate tensile strength, you can see the pressure. It builds, 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 and at this certain point, it starts to loop, it starts to actually become elastic. Uh, that's the yield strength, and then it gets to the ultimate tensile strength, at which point it fails, and then it just plummets down, and it loses all integrity. He's rising that curve. So what does he do? Where does he turn to? He tried to turn inward. He tried to rely on himself. We know many, a lot of people that try to rely on themselves. They, they think there's something great. You look at athletes, you know, and I'm not, again, to cast aspersions of them, but they're very, you know, they can do it. They can carry a game on their back, something. something. Maybe Rodgers can, but we see if somehow, in some cases, he can't. He really needs a team. But, anyways, what does he do? Who does he turn to? The world? No, he turns to God. He finally gets to turn to God. He says in verse, uh, he said here that in verse 17, till I entered the sanctuary of God, then I understood their final destiny. 
This is a key decision point in the psalmist's life. Does he take the broad path or the narrow one? So let's examine what God reveals to him in the second half of this passage. Uh, I forgot to mention at the start of this sermon that some of the resources I used uh, as I was preparing for this over the past week was uh, Matthew Henry's commentary and as well as uh, Jonathan Edwards' Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. So some of the sources, some of the content of this uh, passage came from those men. So what God reveals to the psalmist here in verse 18 is, Surely you place them in slippery ground, on slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. Jonathan Edwards gave a famous sermon uh, in Enfield, Connecticut, called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. He was directing it at the callousness of people's hearts during that time. Um, it was a time where uh, there the people that had come to the new country, to America, they were very, very religious, the Puritans, but uh, there was some hardness of heart that had crept into that uh, culture. I won't get into it now, but anyway, so Jonathan Edwards preaches this, this sermon and describes the play of the wicked in his sermon as they were always exposed to destruction, as one that stands or walks in slippery places is always exposed to fall. Moreover, they are liable to fall of themselves without being thrown down by the hand of another, as he that stands or walks on slippery ground need nothing but his own weight to care, throw him down. So that really paints a stark picture. It's not some outward force that is even necessary to throw or cause these wicked to slip or to be thrown down in destruction. It is merely their own weight that can take them down. And their destruction is sudden. Verse 19 of the psalm, how suddenly they are destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. The same is expressed in 1 Thessalonians 5, 3, while people are saying, there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them. One of the themes of Jonathan Edwards in his sermon was how quickly people can be taken out of this world by any, by any manner, whether it's man-made or natural, and how people deceive themselves on thinking that there is some way they can cheat death or cheat hell. They'll live the way they're living, they'll do, you know, because they like it, they like their situation, they like the people they hang around with, they like what they're doing, and they, they'll make amends at a certain time. They'll make amends before the end, but they deceive themselves because they're so quick that you can be taken out of this world. I uh, was thinking about that famous basketball star, Kobe Bryant. I don't know where he was as far as his walk with the Lord, but everything, wealth, riches, fame, and he died in a helicopter accident. Probably a routine. He had a hel private helicopter, and he crashed, and he was taken out of this world and ushered into the afterlife. So it's no it, we can't plan the rich leave the earth as the fool. So again, as I mentioned here, man deceives himself into thinking that he's in control of his destiny, that he can somehow cheat hell, but man's best laid plans are so quickly rent asunder, aren't they? There is a set of paintings in the Smithsonian uh, Institute in Washington, D.C. That, that when my parents came and visited me when I was in the military at uh, Marine Barracks, Washington, uh, we went there, and it was a set of paintings done by Thomas Cole, an American artist, uh, and it was called The Voyage of Life, and there's a series of four paintings. And the first painting was the, uh, of a child you know, on a on a barge or a boat that was floating down the river, and that river being the river of life in a metaphorical sense. And there was an angel that was actually at the tiller of that barge guiding the, the boat that the little baby was in. The next, the next one is called Youth. And then that you see the uh, child is now grown up into a very young man, a youth. And he's got the tiller. He's got control of the boat. 
and he's and the angel is on the shore waving goodbye <laughs> and the young man is going and he's got it and you can see the, the river of his life headed to a celestial city in the background that celestial city representing all of his hopes and dreams what he was going to do what he was going to accomplish uh, but if you look closely at the picture, this is what makes it so interesting here, is before the river gets to that celestial sea, representing all of his plans, it takes a sharp jump to the right. And you see in the far right corner of the painting, there's some darkness there, there's some storms. The third painting in the series called Manhood. And in this painting, the man is no longer at the tiller. The tiller is broken, it's not even there. The man is on that barge, on his knees, hands clasped together, praying. The angel is up there in the, in the left corner of the picture, still watching over that. But the man realizes he doesn't have control. Just like the psalmist here. The psalmist tried to figure it out. The psalmist tried to rely on himself. And what did that bring? More oppression. The man was there. The man was trying to figure things out. And all that resulted was in more destruction, more damage to his barge as he went down that river of life. The picture in the, in the foreground and background, there's, sto there's rocks and crags. The waters are rough and rushing. But the man is there kneeling in that boat, and he is praying, and he is leaning on God. He is, as the psalmist here, entering the sanctuary of God. The last of the pictures is old age. And the boat, broken down but still, still seaworthy, um, has come out of those rushing, craggy waters, into a calm bay, and the old man is standing there with his gray beard, arms outstretched, and the angel's coming down to take him up to heaven. Very awesome paintings. I have them. Uh, I don't have those ones. I have copies of those in my house. Okay. So, God reveals to him what uh, the plight of the wicked. And we see that in verse uh, 20 that the wicked, they'll be completely swept away by terrors. As a dream when one awakes, so when you arise, O Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. And that is a terrifying thought to be in a position where the Lord God who created the universe will despise you as a fantasy. When we have a nightmare, when, you know, Dina, when your kids have nightmares, they wake up, they're they're terrified, but then on the, in the waking light of the day, they realize that it was just a bad dream, and they can dismiss those nightmares, and those terrors as fantasies, and just put them out of their mind. That's the plight of the wicked, to be dismissed by the Lord of the universe as mere fantasies. And then in 20 verses, the psalmist likens himself to a brute beast before God. So why does the psalmist liken himself to a brute beast? He does that because he's chastising himself for this temptation, for thinking these thoughts, and for probably for not coming before God sooner to get the counsel of the Lord. He says, when, I, when my heart was grieved and his spirit embittered, bitterness, I was like a brute beast before you. He was dumb. He was ignorant. He was worse than ignorant. He didn't even have reason. That's one of the things that separates us from beasts is our ability to reason. Yet, he says, I am always with you. The Lord is faithful. Even when we are not, the Lord is faithful. I was just down at a men's retreat with my brother uh, and some other men. And one of the things that my brother mentioned was when he got saved, at a young age, when he was baptized, back when he was nine, or when we, he was nine, and I was like seven or something like that, and that he really believed that. That was a real moment, but he strayed. But he said in, in, his, in his message to the men there, he said that even though I wasn't faithful in all those years after that point, God was still faithful to me. And that's an important point. This psalmist here, he was struggling with this. He was almost ready to slip, but God was still faithful to him. And then when he came into the sanctuary, came into the counsel of God, God was there. Mm -hmm. 
Matthew Henry said if during in regards to this part of the passage of good men at any time through the surprise and strength of temptation think or speech or act amiss they will reflect upon it with sorrow and shame the psalmist is reflecting upon his temptation with sorrow and shame our victory in the battle of temptation is not won by our own ability but by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit convicting us of our guilt and by the intercessory power of Christ to forgive our sins so it's important that we look within ourselves and address our sin first. Uh, Jesus, during Sermon on the Mount, said, Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye? How can you say to your brother, Let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So despite our missteps in our walk with God, he's still with us, and we see in verse 23, holding our right hand, as, as I mentioned. Even when we're not particularly faithful, God is faithful to us, and he's there ready to take our right hand. And I don't have this in my notes here, but I was keep, kept thinking back to Peter when Christ is walking on the water, and Peter's like, hey, I want to get out to Christ. Let me walk on the water with you. That's pretty cool. And Christ says, come out to me, and Peter walks out to him, and then his faith fails for a moment, and he starts sinking. He lost faith for a moment. But Jesus never, never failed him and reached down and picked him up. So even though our bodies fail, as was mentioned here, God is our strength and portion forever. Earthy strongholds can fall, but God's fortress will stand firm. The wicked, as we see in verse 27, have been set in slippery places, and their foot will slip in due time. Despite their wealth, despite all their prosperity, their foot will slip. The call, so the psalmist, through God's counsel, sees the end of both the wicked and the godly, and he chooses to remain near to God and make him his refuge and to proclaim his deeds to others. He looks, and even, and we see here at the very end, he says, um, the earth has nothing I desire besides you. So looking back at the first part, where he's looking at all the wealth that the wicked have accumulated, he realizes that the earth, even though they have all this wealth, the earth has nothing that he desires besides God. All those earthly riches are nothing compared to the treasure we have in God. And so he continues to say, For I, it is good to be near God. It is not in vain, as he was mentioned earlier in the song. It is good. And he has made the sovereign Lord his refuge. And then he's going to tell everyone of his deeds. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for <clears throat> your faithfulness. We thank you for your counsel. We thank you that you can be that fortress for us to go to that is strong and mighty to save, protect us from the rough waters and the, turbul the turbulent temptations that we undergo <laughs> daily. We ask that you would uplift us and, and gird us up to combat the wiles of the devil. We ask that you would bless this congregation, bless this people, encourage them, and, as, and conform them into more Christ-likeness. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.